Okay. Hello. Uh, I am Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, and um, I had the privilege of interviewing or having a conversation with um, author John Washington. Um, his Haymarket book um, is just out, and the case for open borders. So I'm going to ask, um, ask you first, John, uh, for, well, first I want to congratulate you on the book. It's really like no other work on borders. Um, it's deeply researched, it's accessible, and so well written. And it's always a fraught time to discuss the southern border and immigration, but seems far more urgent now. So your book is not only timely, but really a godsend. You're a dedicated activist, working with many others to change uh, the dire situation. So I really um, honor you for, for that. But I want to ask you, um, what brought you to write this particular book, which is about the border, the southern border focuses, but it's also in the context of worldwide uh, borders and um, and migrants. Uh, so I think it's um, it's so powerful in that way, and it gives a perspective on um, our own border situation that uh, is not just provincial. So how did you decide to do that and to do it that way? And maybe just um, talk about the process and, and um, the, you know, the thesis and the content and how you went about writing the book. Yeah, th thanks, thanks so much, Roxanne. Um, it's really an honor to be in conversation with you. Um, as you know, I cite you a number of times in the book. It really is a pleasure to be uh, having this actual live conversation as well. Um, and I would say, um, despite what may come across as sort of an incendiary title, the case for open borders, uh, the objects of this book was really meant to sort of put out the flames. Uh, I think that there's so much misunderstanding, so much falsehood around border and immigration politics that it's really critical, and um, and I mean by critical, I think that th there are literally lives in the line to understand really what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border, at borders around the world, um, understand the effects of immigration politics, understand the effects of immigration restrictions, and just bring some clarity to the issue. Um, and, you know, it's coming at a time you say it's it's fraught and it's sort of a, a, a timely book, but it's it's always a timely book because or, or this uh, conversation is always timely. I mean, people <laughs> have been on the move um, for decades, for centuries, for millennia. And what we see, especially in the past few decades, the past century or so, is really this enormous increase in border militarization, in immigration enforcement, in this, this global apparatus of trying to stop people from moving. And one of the things that we've learned, um, or maybe another way of putting it, one of the things that we continually fail to learn is that border restrictions and crackdowns actually don't work. And, you know, th there's a number of ways to look at it. Um, you know, you can sort of zoom out and look at really big picture numbers and say, okay, well, right now, there's about 270 million people who are international migrants who have crossed some international border. And that is a about 3.5% of the global population. And that number has held steady for about 100 years. Um, so people are continually moving, and yet uh, the number of folks, the, the, just the net numbers, that 3.5% now represents a lot more people than it did 100 years ago, just because of the rise in the global population. So I think there's a sense 
of, or there's just this fact of inevitability that humans move. I think that is one of our basic anthropological features. And one of the questions I think we should be asking ourselves is how do we respond? The question that politicians seemingly increasingly are asking themselves, or how do we stop it? But um, I, I don't think that's that's actually possible. Um, you know, also we're we're in a really interesting moment right now, catching uh, this the the fallout and the failure of this months long process of uh, trying to come up with some new legislation in the United States. Uh, there's a Senate bill that dropped Sunday night, a couple hundred pages long. And it was supposedly, or it was bipartisan, both Republicans and Democrats, and um, an independent from Arizona, where I am, um, worked together and they wrote this bill. And what we see here, I think, is a failure on a number of different sides. So the Republicans have been trying these tactics for a long time. Um, like I said a second ago, like deterrence doesn't work, but they've been trying that this bill was proposing some of the almost identical measures that have very recently been in place and have shown to not have very much effect. Um, one of those is this authority to almost immediately expel people who cross the border, really targeting asylum seekers, people who are forced to flee from their homes. And we have very recent evidence that Almost the identical um, policy, um, Title 42, which was put in place under the Trump administration, carried over and used much more sensibly under the Biden administration. When they tried to do that and when they tried to push people back immediately after um, apprehending them, we saw numbers go up. So Republicans are trying the same thing that we've seen fail very recently. And then, of course, when they got what they wanted and they got this bill, they balked and they said, well, actually, no, we don't want it. And they I think what that does is lay bare the political nature of it. I'm starting with the Republicans, but I think the Democrats, too. It's, it's really telling that, you know, they, too, have tried this similar tactic and their tactic was to concede to the demands of the far right Republican Party and say, oh, we'll try cracking down on migration. We'll try closing the border. Biden uh, proudly a few weeks ago said that on day one, if this legislation passes, he would shut down the border as if there's some on off switch for which you can shut down a border. Um, you can't do that, nor can, is there an on off switch for human mobility. People will get across, they get across walls, they get across these, these really very uh, draconian immigration politics or policies. And so they've conceded, they, con they conceded all of this and then they get nowhere. And what, what, what do they have to show for it? And we've seen this pre very recently as well. In 2013, they also conceded. Um, Obama supposedly tried to build all this political capital by becoming, you know, one of one of his, uh, you know, more infamous monikers, the deporter in chief. And all of it was supposedly to to gain political capital so that he could get comprehensive immigration legislation passed. And it didn't work. We saw it in 2007 as well. So we try again and again the same things and they keep not working. So one of the objects of this book was to break out of this cycle. And, and I'm concentrating here on the United States, but really I try to take a more international lens because we see sort of a similar pattern in a number of other countries and regions. Break out of this cycle, and I think especially for the left, we need to assert a vision. We need to have some idea of what we want. It's, I think it's much easier to explain what the anti-immigrant right wants. They want to close the border, they want to limit immigration, or so they say, and there's, there's actually a little bit of nuance there as well, because that's sort of speaking out of one side of their mouth, the other side of their mouth, they recognize the need for migrants and the need for migration. Um, but so on the left, the, what, is, what is their vision? It's like somewhere kind of in between. I hear a lot of people um, say, and I think this was the case during the Trump administration when all sorts of folks were up in arms and incensed by the dehumanizing tactics of Trump and the Trump administration. Well, we don't want open borders, but we don't want to see what's going on with babies ripped out of their parents' arms. 
But I think that argument, you, making that argument, you're on a really slippery slope. So what what do you want then? So you don't want it to be quite as bad or you, you don't want it to be horrible for some people, but maybe there's some other people that it's okay. Because what we've seen is this, these softer tactics and this like um, much more humane rhetoric from the Democrats, from the Biden Obama administrations, we've seen family separation from both of those administrations as well. I've documented and reported on cases of family separation under under the Biden administration, which we thought that came to an end, but it really didn't, um, not completely. So where where do we stand, and what what is this vision? I think trying to articulate um, what we actually want rather than just play defense is, is one of the other aims of this book. And last, um, from a personal standpoint, you know, I come from a family of immigrants and uh, I think this is something that is just urgently necessary. We need to extend these fundamental rights of mobility of, of, of human movement, of freedom of movement uh, beyond our borders. And I think that if we don't, we fall into this trap of what is essentially global apartheid. Some people have some rights. Some people have the right to move because you have an American or EU passport. And some people don't have that right and they can't cross the border and they are locked in or, you know, they're immobilized into these um, situations that they want to leave from. And I think it's just fundamentally unfair. And and so I just, you know, also sort of come from a, a very personal uh, place and I want to make this this case and just try to clarify things a little bit for as a tool. I think people people sort of need to understand some of these basic historical truths and need some of this context and then also need to kind of look ahead and see what possibly could be input, it could be uh, applied. Well, you know, there's also the factor that we're getting to be a very gray um, population in the United States and it affects social security for future people because there are no young people, not enough young people paying into it. We have job shortages and we need we need immigrants. Uh, of course, like Tom, uh, Donald Trump said, why not Norwegians, you know? <laughs> like, um, not these awful Haitians and uh, Central Americans and Latinos. So um, that's really, um, you know, the, the white supremacy involved is uh, really makes it so much worse and painful, I think. Um, yeah, you you mentioned yeah. the 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 need for immigrants. That that is something that, like I said, that um you know I think actually both parties are sort of are able to express this public need, supposed need for a crackdown, and 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 you know the the, the Senate negotiations I think really lay bare that it's it's really just a political game and it's it's part of uh, electioneering tactics, but they also recognize if they're if, if, if they're honest, that we do need immigrants. And, and you know, the despite all of these crackdowns, all of the wall building throughout the world, um, migration continues. Um, and, you know, there's a, a recent report um, from, a, a, from a construction agency that there's over a half a million job vacancies in construction alone in the United States. Um, and if we don't fill some of these jobs, the economy is going to start faltering. Um, and so we see that the people who are cracked down upon, and I, I, I said with this um, most recent uh, proposed legislation, it really focused on asylum seekers. So the um, Title 42, so did a lot of the other, um, the recent immigration policies really targeted the people who are forced to flee rather than those who are able to, you know, through family reun reunification or through some other method, um, get into the United States or get into Europe or get into some other country that they're trying to go to. And the United States has continually taken in about a, over a million people a year. So we recognize that that is something that is urgently necessary for the country. And yet we scapegoat and, you know, fear monger and paint with this broad brush, this idea of 
an invasion and these people were coming in and, um, you know, coming in with their families. And yet at the same time, we know that actually we need these books. Um, so it's just it, the, the duplicity, the hypocrisy is another thing that I think needs more work to be done to expose. Um, and this is something that, you know, as as journalists, as as researchers, as, as authors, it's, it's, it's actually upon us to speak clearly because we we yeah. letting the politicians do so is going to um, just rile up all this angst and all this fear, which has um, gotten to us where we're at right now. Yeah, it's kind of desperate here in California, these, uh, you know, commercial farmers out in the valley and Sacramento Valley, they don't, they don't have enough workers, you know, to pick the crops and plant the crops and mm-hmm. tend the crops. And um, they uh, want open borders. But I think the vilification, I listen to a program every morning, sort of addicted to it, a call-in program, Washington Journal on uh, C-SPAN. Mm. And uh, it's very early in the morning, <laughs> very early in the morning here. Um, but I, I listen to these people. Their main thing is immigration. People call in mostly from the center of the country and not the, uh, I don't think I've ever heard anyone from New York or Boston or San Francisco. So it's like Trump's people call in a lot. And they, um, they just vilify uh, migrants, you know, uh, immigration. And, um, you know, the, the, the um, uh, person who hosts it, uh, they had the practice of not answering your questions or making a comment. If it's too nasty or vulgar or fascist, they just cut them off. But... It really is, I think everyone should listen to that and just see um, the misinformation, you know, that people are getting about the economy. And um, so- well, Can I, I just wanna add one yeah, point? Yeah, go there. ahead. Um, I also had that experience. I mean, you write a book called The Case for Open Borders and you're gonna get some, uh, some <laughs> angry uh, tweets and DMs and whatnot, but- right. um, I'm, you know, I'm a local reporter. I work for Arizona Luminaria, a local right. um, Tucson, Phoenix-based outlet, and I go to a lot of public meetings. And also at these public meetings, you hear the same thing, um, right. that supposedly these county and city officials should close down the open borders. And, you know, this bill, which we've talked about a couple of times already, a lot of even uh, senators have called it an open, or senators or Congress people have called it an open borders bill. And I think this is part of the problem is just what, do words have no more meaning? Like what what are you talking about with open borders? Because here are just a couple basic facts that I think dispel that the just radical idea is, well, the, the, the bill proposed enormous uh, boosts in the budgets for uh, Customs and Border Protection or Border Patrol and ICE. Um, increased detention capacity, rising the threshold for asylum, and the ability for the president to shut down the border, supposedly, and expel people immediately. So open borders, what, what are we talking about? Or, you know, open borders uh, p- policies of the Biden administration, that idea gets thrown around so much by politicians, by people who absolutely know better that for one basic example, the Biden administration has either deported or expelled over 3 million people. Um, then there's a lot of complaints. Well, actually, he's also letting a lot of people in. And this is true. But the numbers under the Trump administration, the people who were let into the country, even after they were apprehended by Border Patrol, it's actually over 52 percent of the people that were contacted or apprehended by Border Patrol were actually released into the country under the Trump administration. So it's like, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I said, what uh, happened? <laughs> it's just taking back the words. Like, like I think yeah. the word border itself is like totally misconstrued and totally misunderstood. Right. Open borders as a concept. If we're calling what ha- is happening now open borders, we, we need a, we need new new words, um, or we need to take back the the term. And I think that's something that I'm trying to do here. Right. 
Well, John, uh, could I get you to um, maybe read some from the book, a uh, passage from the book, so, so that your listeners get a sense of your writing, which I think is wonderful, and of course the content as well. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks, Roxanne. <laughs> um, I'll just uh, start right at the beginning here. I like borders. Borders are places of connection, clash, and blend. They define cultures, languages, arts, cuisines, habits, by exhibiting, testing, mingling, and breaking their distinctiveness and insularity. Borders are where humans trade in goods, ideas, and beliefs. They are places of ingenuity, mescla, neologism, and entrepot. Borders mark difference and possibility. As sites of beauty and definition, alloy and creation, they spark vibrant and unexpected harmony. Something only is what it is, as philosopher Hegel put it, in its limit and through its limit. Infamously, however, regimes of crushing violence and dispiriting exploitation sully the creative and polyphonic potential of borders. As we deny, cast out, and crack down, we have turned our thresholds into barricades. Given the proliferation of such walling off of human beings, of human decency, and of human potential, how do we respond? Yeah, and that's, you know, I, I was sort of already asking that question, you know, uh, I, I think I, I can't emphasize enough this inevitability um, of migration. And, and you know, I've, I've mentioned a couple big picture numbers like, you know, 3.5% of the global population. Um, you can, you know, drill down into specific countries, the United States, um, the percentage of the foreign born population living in the United States right now is about 15% is a little bit lower than that, I think. That's almost identical to what it was 100 years ago, despite the rise of bordering. Um, you can look at even a more recent period, so from the early 1980s until about 2020, and that was really when the first like actual segments of wall went up, when the border was really begun to be militarized, when all of these anti-immigrant measures were put in place. The number of people born in Latin America in the United States went up from under 5 million to I think it's like 30 million. Then just like a couple other examples like Brexit, which was, you know, people were in such a tizzy over supposed influx of migrants and what was happening with being part of the EU when they wanted to stop the migrants from taking their health care and all this stuff. The year immediately following Brexit, more people migrated to the UK than the year before. And just like there's example after example of actually the border doesn't do what it's intended to do or what it's purported to do. Um, and people find a way anyway. So if we're going to understand, if we, if we accept that, then we just have to think about then what are the policies that put in place to make it more humane, to make it better for you know, the communities that have already been established and the new people who are coming into the communities. I mean, I, I think that's really the only question that we should be asking. Right. Yeah, I like, you know, uh, um, I can't remember his name, but a South Asian immigrant um, to the United States. Um, he said he, he wrote this fantastic book. Um, on you know really blasting the U.S. on immigration, but uh, I like what he said that uh, we are here because you were there. Right. You know the United States destabilizing all the like Honduras, you know using it as a stationary battleship to overthrow the the Sandinistas. It. It just destroyed, you know, the their culture. I, you know, I was there and I saw it, and the poverty and the gangs. You know, of course, gangs always uh, come out of of these situations because people have to eat, you know. So they rob and you know kill. I mean, some of them are really very, and, and there's drugs involved, and it wasn't like that before. You know, I was in Honduras before. The Contra War, and it it wasn't it was a peaceful place. It was very poor, but it was peaceful. So that's you know I I think that's really important to keep in mind that 
so many of these people come from places that have been um, destroyed and destabilized and make it impossible to live there. Mm -hmm. And others, you know, just just put into so much poverty mm -hmm. that they need jobs and jobs are here. They can, <laughs> they can work here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, that sort of calls to mind another issue or, or a huge problem with this system of bordering that we have is, you know, yeah, we are here because you were there. Um, the the idea of root causes and, and why are people moving? And I think that, you know, I, I talked, I've mentioned a couple times so far about what borders don't do and how they don't actually function very well to keep people out. But they don't do nothing either. And I think that the best way to really think about what a, the effects that a, a border actually has is thinking about it as a tool. So it does it does slow people down. You know, it, it's an it's a physical impediment. Um, it does divert people um, to cross in different ways or different places um, or to use tools like, um, you know, a trusty Hand Depot saw that Home Depot saw that that folks use to get through the the border um, on the U.S.-Mexico border right now, the, the wall on the U.S.-Mexico border right now. But then also just like thinking like a little bit bigger picture of like what if, what, 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 what does it actually accomplish? And I think that we see here is, and here I like lean on the, the work of Justin Akers Chacon, who has done tremendous amount of work trying to understand um, just the economic situation and disparities between the United States and Mexico and, and Central America. And how, because of bordering, because of this complementary free trade for goods and capital, and blocked trade for or blocked, you know, labor um, movement, companies and corporations in the United States are able to exploit and use the labor and um, take advantage of lower wages, take advantage of. Um, like less robust labor laws and, you know, diminishing union activity and actually extract a lot of the things that we want from them. Um, he also calculated uh, the number of free trade agreements. I think the World Trade Organization counts something approaching, I think it's 400 um, free trade agreements throughout the world. And um, Akers Jacon last uh, tabulation was that about 40 of them, only about 40 of them, contained any provision for the movement of labor, the movement of, of human beings, and those were for extremely highly specialized uh, jobs. So most of the people actually couldn't move. So we see how like capital and 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 goods are able to traipse across borders so easily, but humans aren't. And the reason that is the case is because we're able to keep those goods cheaper for for the corporations, or 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 at least get the profits um, more for corporations. So it's really just like this manipulative use of that border um, for a reason that isn't usually talked about. But we just see that in, in you know, like you if you go to the U.S.-Mexico border, you go on either side, you see that, oh, yeah, there are these clusters of maquiladoras, these like basically sweatshops in places like Juarez and places like Agua Prieta. And you, we're all this these enormous concentrations of people who are putting together things that will come across the border with, without tariff to the United States consumer and making the extra bucks for the corporations. Um, but then those same uh, free trade agreements are blocking the people from coming across. Um, so I think like that's one other aspect of, you know, it's occasionally like mentioned, but it's something that just, you have to keep in mind when you think about like, how a border actually doesn't or does work. That kind of leads to maybe, um, you know, you're, you're there and you, I'm sure you travel to other places on the border. Just what, what, what's going on now? We see all kinds of things on TV and uh, people, you know, crowds of people sitting on the side of the road or getting through those barbed wire things that Texas puts through. Um, but I think we don't really know the depths of it, you know, of what uh, what the situation is and what the people living along 
the border, you know, permanently, how they're dealing with it and their views. I'm sure it varies from state to state. We don't have, have as much drama in California as just as many people are coming in. It's just not dramatized and, you know, really demonized by our yeah, politicians. I mean, it, it, it really sort of depends. I mean, there's so much idiosyncrasy, you know, in each place. Um, and as well as with, you know, it, it's we're, we've been talking mostly abstractly about all of this, but, you know, it's really important to remember that these are people. And, and they each have all of their very complicated lives that they're wrapped up in. And so what's happening at the border right now is there is a number of measures that are blocking people from coming across. Um, we have seen um, more people coming to the U.S. border than in recent history. Um, is, is this like a necessarily like constantly upward trend. I think it's a little bit too early to tell still, but um, definitely 2023 was a was a big year at the border. Most of the folks um, are so the the way that they have it working now is that if you're coming to try to ask for asylum, there are some um, policies in place where you can try to ask for some form of humanitarian parole. Uh, from your country of origin, but most people who are actually showing up at the border are doing so trying to gain some form of protective status, asylum, or, or, or something else, but mostly asylum. And they there's a phone app that is called CBP-1 that there are 1,400 and, sorry, uh, 1,450 appointments per day. Um, so the border, uh, the port of entry closest to where I am right now is Nogales. And in Nogales, there's 100 people that are allowed in per day through this phone app. The phone app is only in English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole, but we have people from many other different countries, um, French speakers from Africa, indigenous language speakers from different parts of Mexico and Central America and elsewhere. And if they don't have a functioning phone, if they don't have the capacity to, to read in one of those three languages, um, they're kind of out of luck. And also the phone appointments take a long time to get. Some people get lucky and get an appointment within a couple of weeks, but other people I've spoken with wait six months or more trying every morning to get an appointment through this dumb little app and it doesn't work and there's error messages and they send, uh, you know, questions or complaints to a, a CBP1 um, email address that they never hear back. And remember, these are asylum seekers and you know there's been a lot of banding about in the news about whether they're true asylum seekers or not you can't tell if someone's a true asylum seeker or not until you actually hear their claim so what's happening is these asylum seekers forced to flee their own country or fleeing their own country have to end up waiting south of the u.s mexico border for sometimes months and so if they're and as some of them are literally running for their lives you just stop and slow down and wait for six months when you're potentially the people who are persecuting you are on your heels. Um, this holds true for folks in Mexico as well. So these people are fleeing um, either lack of protection or persecution um, from their own country, and now they're stuck there still. So what are the options? They can ask for some very limited exception to get through, and that usually doesn't work and takes at least weeks. Or, and this is what we're seeing more and more, they can take to the desert. They can either, you know, submit themselves into the arms of human smuggling organizations and get, you know, funneled and ferried through a, 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 a section of the desert. They sometimes have to walk for days or wait for days in the elements, exposed to the elements. Or if they're uh, further east in Texas, cross the river. We've seen people die. A mom and her two children died uh, about a month ago trying to cross the the river and there what's there's the, how that plays out you know you could kind of go there's 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 many different ways that depending on who you are or where you're from and exactly um we you know what the situation is in, in that specific spot there's a number of different ways this can play out but because of, of an asylum ban that was in, instituted by um the biden administration after the end of title 42 most of the people actually are not eligible for asylum. 
most of the people, even those who have been paroled in and who are now have the, are subject to this asylum ban, have no pathway towards permanent status, have no pathway towards citizenship. So what we're literally doing, and there are there are millions of people who have now come through this these these pathways. What we're literally doing is creating a second class, second tier of 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 of, of non citizens, a second tier of 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 people in the United States. Um, so, you know, like I, I've talked a lot about the inevitability of, 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 of human migration or mobility, and we see it play out here. When you, when you try to dam up a crossing point or when you try to clog up ways that people get across through like this patchwork of policies, people find other ways and we either grant them rights or we limit their rights and create this like underclass of population as 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 we're effectively doing now. And I think that's one important point to note. Like there's so much that needs to be disabused about especially right wing talking points. And, you know, Elon Musk has has thrown this idea out that supposedly the Democrats are bringing all these people to vote for them. But most of these people won't be able to vote ever in a, in a federal election. I mean, unless things change. But right now, as of the policies put in place by the Biden administration, there's no pathway towards, you know, punching a ballot in the federal election. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the situation, again, I, I sort of got a little bit abstract trying to, like, explain the pathways. But I'll tell you a couple brief stories about some of the people that I've met. Um, I was out doing some reporting in uh, further west in Arizona in a pretty remote area. And there they um, limit uh, access for vehicles. And I needed to get out to this one spot along the border, and it was way out there. And I thought, well, they're not going to let um, me drive out there, but there's no sign saying I can't ride a bike out there. So I took a mountain bike and was biking along this dirt border wall. And there's basically no one around except these occasional construction workers rewelding um, holes in the wall. And um, I saw this man who is from uh, the Punjab. And he was a Sikh Indian man, and he had crossed the border completely alone, um, and which was is, is is very rare. Almost all the people oh. crossing this this region cross in groups because they have to submit themselves to the smugglers. Because oh. if not, well, they get in trouble with the smugglers. They have the, that area really well locked down. Somehow he got across alone. I don't know if he scaled the thirty foot wall or found a hole in it or what. And I was. The alarm to see him. He he was in decent shape for wherever he came from. He didn't speak much English or Spanish, so I, we had trouble communicating. And right as we were talking, he was like asking if I could give him a ride, but I was on this bike. <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't know what I can do here. Um, I tried calling because he actually wanted to turn himself into Border Patrol. I didn't have cell phone service, and I saw uh, a construction vehicle coming up. I flagged it down. I like jumped on the side to talk to the guy. I was like, look. Um, this man needs help. He needs to, you need to take him to the road or he wants to turn himself into border patrol. He's in medical distress. The guy's like, no, it's against policy. Can't do it. I'm like, this guy's out here alone. I, I can't take him. I'm, I'm on a bike. I, he really needs help. He, the guy just stopped talking to me. The trucker stopped talking to me. It's like, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do here. I tried. I tried to like, you know, appeal to his good nature and nothing was working. And he just, he just wouldn't even respond to me. Wouldn't even look at me. He was trying to like drive away, but I was like kind of hanging on the truck. Finally jumped down and looked for the guy, the, the migrant from the Punjab. And I didn't see him. I was like, what, what happened? And the truck immediately started driving away and I turned to watch it. And I see that he's clinging on the back of the truck, like Spider-Man on the back of the truck. <laughs> He, was, he had a small little backpack. He was in, you know, athletic pants and a T-shirt. It's like this man got all the way from India, somehow avoided the the cartels, the human smugglers in Mexico, somehow got over the wall alone, and it was had the, you know, the, the spontaneous just idea to jump on the back of the truck. My guess is that this man is probably like already, I don't know, like started his own business and is probably employing Americans in like some little <laughs> place. <laughs> or something or wherever he's going you know, <laughs> who wouldn't want to hire someone who has that sort of gumption and 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 capacity um so here sort, sort of a positive story i mean i have no idea what happened maybe he did turn himself into border patrol maybe he got the boot um a sort of a positive story but you know other situations i've come across recently are um a a guatemalan 
mother and an eight-year-old child were trying to cross the border for months and couldn't get appointments and couldn't figure out a way to get across. Um, she didn't feel like she had the capacity to walk through the desert. The boy was eight. She was scared to do that. And so the decision that she was contemplating was, well, I'll send them across alone because CBP does process unaccompanied minors. And so here you have this coerced family separation where because of this clog of policies stopping people who need to cross, they have to figure out ways to do it. And the mom is thinking of giving up her kid, you know, hoping that she'll see him again, but who knows? But even if she does, even if she somehow he gets across and somehow she gets across later, like again, thinking about the effects of the border, thinking about the effects of these immigration policies, what happens to that kid? What about the trauma? How many months is he going to be alone without his mom? How many months is he going to be in some facility? You know, and, and what is his future? Like, hopefully he can get over it, but who knows? And do we want to do that to people, especially if he does, is able to stay? Do we want to make people get over those enormous emotional hurdles and, and deal with that trauma? Because wherever he ends up, he, he is going to be, you know, so incredibly traumatized by, by, by what's happened to him, by what he's already seen on his journey just to get to the U.S.-Mexico border. And then what? Like, this, is, this is what these policies are doing. To people. Yeah, the trauma of, um, that's something we don't hear about very much, just the effects that, that this is having on, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are going to be suffering, especially the children, the rest of their lives. And <clears throat> it's, um, you know, it's it's a um, cruel, it's just cruel not to teach, treat any human being like a human being instead of, a, um, you know, we, people don't mistreat animals they're considered crazy, you know, if they and and mentally ill if they if they torture animals or don't give them food or give them space. Um, but for people, it's as if they, you know, you can't say they treat like animals because they treat animals better, <laughs> better than that. Well, you know, Adam Sewer had um, the writer for the Atlantic had a a a good explanation for it that the cruelty is the point and he was talking about if i recall correctly i think he was talking about the family separation policy under the trump administration but it's that framing isn't unique to the trump administration um there the policy of prevention through deterrence which was put in place in 1994 which was literally cruelty was the point that was trying to make the crossing dangerous and deadly enough and rely on that human suffering and death to deter other people yeah. from crisis. and that was put in place under a democratic administration so yeah very much the the cruelty is is one of the ways that borders function yeah and so many of them have already been traumatized by the darien gap and people dying and um you know it's, it's horrific. i mean yeah, the, the the numbers out of there too. I mean, it it it, it almost seems meaningless because you can't really understand. I mean, you can't really understand what, what the sort of incredible traumas that someone goes through when they just tell you briefly. But the numbers are shocking. I mean, during the Title Forty Two policy, there was over thirteen thousand documented cases. Over thirteen thousand documented cases of rape, torture, kidnapping, and death of people who were pushed back because of that policy. That ended last May. Title 42 was rescinded finally last May. And since then, the same organization, Human Rights First, has documented, um, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, well over a thousand people who have suffered those same things um, who are, have, are blocked because of the asylum ban now. Um, so yeah, the, 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 there is incredible human misery. And I think that's really important to remember. One other thing that I think it's also helpful to remember, and this to me always 
like it's a it's a, almost like a self reminder is of the humanity of of what we're talking about is that when you're I, I spent a lot of time in migrant shelters I've spent a lot of time talking to people who have just crossed the border about to cross the border and the, there is trauma and it's incredible and people hiking through the Daring Gap it's just amazing what folks have to go through it's 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 shocking but when you're talking to people they're people and they're they're funny and they're having fun and they're making the best of things yeah. and they are, are hanging out with each other and they're making jokes with you they fall in love with each other you know they're just they're normal folks and those are the people that we're submitting these submitting these or like imposing these things on um it's not all doom and gloom because yeah. of i think the resiliency of of human beings yeah, yeah it's amazing uh <laughs> that it, that can be but it is. it is well you know these um these bills and the arguments going on right now on the Biden administration's uh, willingness to you know, just seal the border and forget about it. Um, could you explain a little bit, maybe people are as confused as I am about the, uh, <laughs> just what's happening now with the um, legislation? Ah, um... I think nothing's happening now with the legislation. Um, <laughs> Easy answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Senate it, it was yesterday and they didn't pass it. Um, you know, there was, I think, five Democratic senators who seemed to vote on principle um, against the bill. Um, a number of, obviously, a number of Republican senators, despite it being almost like a wish list of, of what they wanted, voted against the bill. And it wouldn't have mattered anyway if the Senate had passed it because... Um, uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson and a number of others in the Republican Party said, no way, uh, you know, dead on arrival. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have any particular insight, but I mean, I, I, I think a lot of the reporting is, is accurate that they were basically um, following Trump's lead and saying, we can't give Biden any sort of a win on this legislation in an election year. Um, that, that seems to be of, of what happened you know so as, as we've talked about a couple times it, it, it's so political that even doing what they want to do and you know the senator from oklahoma your home state james langford was very frustrated with that um and he, he was candid about like what this is what we wanted to do we got it and now my own party is you know torpedoing it and, and that's exactly what happened. so nothing nothing's happening with the legislation um you know you know this was months in the working um is it, it was bipartisan or tripartisan with uh, our independent senator from Arizona. And um, what's next for the border and immigration? Um, probably a lot of, uh, you know, hellfire rhetoric and um, lack of movement on the, the political or on the legislative front. And then more of the same actually along the border lines um, in, until and probably well past November. Well, I wonder, you know, all of this chaos and um, um, I don't know, just this um, damage that's being done in that pretty delicate um, borderland from, you know, California to to Texas. Um, what's the environmental uh, damage and loss, and, and um, why would open borders? Uh, uh, be a better situation all around, but including the environment, which we, you know, are con so concerned about um, in general, but um, the wreckage there that I can only imagine. Um, uh, and with the climate change that it's, uh, it, it's a damage, you know, a, a deep damage to um, all of us, you know, to fighting climate change and um, trying to, you know, do things better to not uh, uh, kill all of humanity. But um, is anyone paying attention to that besides, of course, you and your <laughs> and your circles? You know, I, I had a really interesting conversation just last week um, with a man who was one of the leaders of trying to reintroduce or reintroducing Mexican wolves 
into southern New Mexico and northern New Mexico. That I hadn't heard before that uh, on the day Trump took office, so that would be what, January 21, 2021, somewhere right around there, they tracked a, um, a Mexican wolf, that's the species, uh, um, also from Mexico in this case, who crossed the border in 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 like from um, Chihuahua into New Mexico, and you know spent about four days wandering around in some of the wilderness there, and then crossed south back into Mexico, and he was telling me that that is no longer possible because there's a border wall there, yeah. and if the Mexican wolves have any chance of survival, they need the genetic diversity that would come from um, some of the packs in northern Mexico and from some of the packs, they're small, in southern United States, in Arizona, and mostly in New Mexico. Um, you know, this was, I was talking to him actually for another story I was doing about jaguars, another species nice. that um, there have been a number of sightings. It's really exciting in Arizona. There's at least two right now, two jaguars in southern Arizona. There may be a few more. Um, this is their historic natural habitat. This is where the jaguar evolved in the sky islands of southern Arizona and New Mexico. Um, now they've you know, proliferated much, much more in Mexico, Central America, and South America. But um, they are a key apex predator. They are essential to the health of the ecosystems here along the border. And if we close off the few remaining gaps in the wall in Arizona, they will not survive. I mean, this is what the wildlife biologists have told me. They're, they could reintroduce them, they could drop the helicopter a few in, but they will not actually survive. And, and that's not just uh, sadness for this beautiful marquee species, but that's actually um, really threatening the ecosystems down here. So this is like sort of a, a small example of what borders can wreak in terms of um, the natural environment. Um, there's a number of other factors here, just thinking about ecosystems um, or global, you know, systems as a whole, is that, you know, we don't really know yet what uh, the future of climate migration will look like. There's been some really excellent reporting um, and some speculation, but it is speculation. I think it's probably accurate, but, you know, we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. There, it, it, it's so complex, but certainly more people will be on the move. And when we think about, um, again, like this question I keep on coming back to in this book and in this talk as well is how do we respond? I mean, we, we can, um, create some pathways for people to move safely. Um, I think that there is an urgent necessity to rethink how we uh, categorize refugee and asylum seekers. And I think there needs to be a um, capacity for climate refugees to, to fall into those categories. But if we don't find ways to help people resettle in safer areas that aren't gonna be devastated by incredible storms or droughts, you know, decades long droughts and, and you know, the depletion of fishing and all, all these other things. Um, what is the alternative? And, and the alternative is trying to, uh, like, immobilize them. So um, in, in an area of severe drought or where agriculture is failing, are we going to try to build a wall around those people and not let them leave? Um, we could try, and, and, and that is something that um, seems to be what, what's happening now. Um, there's a stat from a report last year that um, uh, the United States over a recent five-year period spent 11 times more on border infrastructure than climate change mitigation. But as I keep coming back to, like, people are going to find a way out. So if you try to kind of uh, immobilize them or lock them into places that are becoming less and less habitable because of climate change, what's going to happen? You're creating a political powder keg and people are going to escape anyway. People might, some people might suffer and die in the meantime, and people might take more dangerous journeys to try to get out of those enclosed or half closed spaces, but it's going to happen anyway. I think it would be just... Uh, absolutely immoral to think that the best response sorry about that no problem are you still there are you there yeah anyone there 
Can you hear us, Roxanne? Hello? Uh oh, some technical difficulties. Sure. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, I guess I, I was, you know, just just trying to think about what the alternative to finding safe pathways for people to flee migration as and or cl climate migration or forced climate migration, and you know, you can think about it as like, wow, like the people from Honduras and Guatemala are undergoing these droughts and they're going to be needing to flee, but the number of people who have moved in the United States because of climate disasters in the past few years is enormous. It's not something that's going to just affect the global south. It's something that's going to affect all of us as fires continue to rage in California and elsewhere, as storms batter Texas and Florida and elsewhere and New York, um, people are going to move. And we have that freedom to move within the United States, but to try to deny it to others who are fleeing other spots, I think um, just makes no sense and, and is going to come back and bite us in, in a bad way. Um, so yeah, just finishing that thought as also, we're kind of, I think, getting signals to field some questions from the audience. Yeah, and uh, let me just ask you um, one more thing briefly, um, to, and maybe one of our listeners will want to ask this. Um, just how do you think we can get to open borders? How can we change this? <laughs> I know you're working very hard on it, but do you have hope? Are you optimistic? <laughs> I do. I do, actually. Um, this is not just like a literary exercise, this book. Um, you know, I, I think that this is um, something that we need to take seriously. And I think that um, the coming increases in migration, in climate migration, and the ongoing failures of bordering is eventually going to set in. And we are going to finally understand that it's not working. And we need to do something different. Um, and I think that, you know, here's here's an option. Um, and, you know, I think that I, I was already reading uh, the first questions and I could kind of shift to those now because I think this, sure. is, this is part of that answering as part of what you're asking, Roxanne, is, um, you know, yeah, so I'll just read it. So this is, um, sorry, I don't have the names of the people who are asking, but this is the question. Please don't take this as a bad faith question, but I'd like, and I, I don't, um, whoever you are, um, but I'd like to hear you talk about how resources would be allocated, social services distributed, and global issues handled in a world of open borders. What would the mechanisms for addressing things like this look like? Great question. And, you know, one of the 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 things that I try to do with this book too is dispel a lot of those fears. Um, you know, I don't know if we have time to get into all of it now, but looking hard at the economics of bordering and the economics of migration, it's just not something you need to worry about. It's just not. And you know, I can point you to, and I do in the book, many many serious all serious economists. Um, there is maybe a couple exceptions, but then they've had holes poked in their arguments that migration is good for the economy. Migration is, that doesn't really affect that much wages, but if there's any effect, it's almost always a slight positive effect. Um, unemployment, it doesn't affect unemployment. It doesn't um, increase unemployment. Migrants don't take jobs. There's a great um, book by Avi Chomsky. Uh, yeah. yeah, they take our jobs and twenty other myths about migration or something like that, right. and um, they just don't. Um, th th you know th that that conception is based on um, a false idea, um, and it's called the the lump of labor fallacy. Is that there's only a set number of jobs in an economy, and that's not the case. Um, jobs beget jobs more or less, um, and so when folks are coming, they usually come to a place where there are jobs. And that is one of the biggest incentives in migration, even in, you know, um, forced migration. Forced migrants, people who are forced to flee their homes, typically go to places, almost always rather, go to places where there are opportunities, not just safety. Um, it just makes sense. I mean, that's what you would do. That's what I would do. 
you, like, yeah, you, you, you might need to flee immediately to one spot, but then you're going to try to end up and settle in the spot where there are opportunities for you, whether safety and a job. Um, so, you know, we've already mentioned, I think, uh, some of the, the jobs needed, you said, in, you know, uh, farms in California. I mentioned the half a million plus um, need for workers uh, in the construction industry. Teachers, same thing in the United States. Um, and you can look at so many different countries that have these same um, worker shortages and need migrants. So this is the positive, sort of the um, dispelling the negative case uh, economically for migration. But if you look at it uh, the, from the opposite way as well, um, it, it further sort of underscores that migrants, how much migrants are needed for jobs. So when you deport people, um, even in times of economic distress, you undercut the economy and you undercut the um, employment rate. So um, there's a couple studies that were done um, after the stock market crash in um, 1929 and the, the, the following Great Depression. They instituted, the U.S. government instituted the, the Mexican Repatriation Act and started deporting Mexicans from some place in the United States, including some rural areas, like I think Oklahoma was one of them, Roxanne. And uh, they showed that in those from those communities where people were deported, um, wages went down, people lost jobs, and the entire economy, not entire, but like the economy really suffered where they were deporting people from. So this idea about how, how are we going to figure this out? How are we going to allocate um, these resources? How are we going to um, you know deal with like our wealth for society? There's a a famous quip that someone has that says you can either have a welfare state or you can have free migration. You can't have both. But that's actually not true. Um, migrants, um, the way that the U.S. currently is set up, undocumented migrants um, are eligible for very few um, uh, needs-based welfare provisions. And what they do is they actually contribute more to the pot than they take. And even um, people who are, you know, are documented migrants, the same thing. They actually, their studies have shown that they use welfare benefits less than native, uh, native born folks and um, over a lifetime actually contribute more. So the real allocation, it kind of figures itself out. And there's, uh, and I'll, I'll stop joining on about this for in a second, but like there's all these sort of natural experiments where there's been these huge influxes of migrants over a relatively short period in places like Israel in the 1990s, in places like France in the 1960s, in places like Miami in 1980, when a bunch of Cubans came to the to the city. And all those places, like it didn't take too much sort of like um, overlording or engineering the economy kind of worked itself out and it actually didn't result in unemployment, lost wages, uh, or a run on, on welfare benefits. Um, yeah, so I, I, I guess I'm like handling both um, answer and ask, ask and answer at this point. So that was uh, a long answer to this question and I'll, I'll, I'll move on to the second. Um, or actually, I'll move on to the third because it, it addresses us both, and I'd like to bring you in, Roxanne. Um, I'm curious to hear what both Roxanne and John think about the growing threats of vigilantes and nativist violence in the U.S., and how should we be dealing with these forces? Roxanne, you and I were talking about this right before the, mm -hmm. the chat. Um, do, you have a, do you have a thought there? Yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book of essays on uh, white nationalism and... Uh, so I've been paying attention and hadn't really thought about doing an essay on the border and the white nationalists there, but I think I will since um, since I've read uh, read your book, uh, John, and um, have material you know that I could really use. But um, I think that's you know the we we never hear much about the Canadian border you know being a plot. <laughs> Um, we don't hear much about people coming in on airplanes, tourists on tourist visas, and never going, you know, never leaving. Um, that's the most immigrants, that's the most undocumented immigrants in the United States, and many of them are Irish. So, you know, they're white and Europeans, um, or, you know, maybe Eastern Europeans, Russians, but not, you know, not from the global south. And um, so I think the white supremacy just built into the whole history of the um, 
Mexican border. It used to be a different border, you know, until half of it was taken with two years of war uh, in the mid 19th century. So um, I, you know, I live in what was once Mexico here. And uh, so I think this, this white nationalism is a, you know, a, a sense of we have the right to, you know, everything and even to take other places um, that should just to occupy them because we're superior. There's this white supremacy, that white nationalism that has been given so much air by uh, Trumpism, and not just Trump himself, but a whole movement that brought him to power. Um, and, you know, just all through the country. I mean, he, he didn't do it top down. Um, that it's it goes back into the nine historian, you know, and have traced that, that it's a white republic. And the old settlers, I come from old settlers, you know, the Scots-Irish and uh, pre-revolutionary. And I know the mindset in rural Oklahoma is um, in these white, you know, white places, white town like I grew up in, um, they um, they feel, you know, superior, even when they're very, very poor. So there is this, you know, this, uh, the the white nationalism, the, the clips I've seen, and I've only seen some video clips and all of how they, they're uh, rounding up um, migrants and kind of holding them. Sometimes I think they, they tie them up to benches and then they bring, you know, go get the border patrol to, to come and arrest them. And they that's just happening. It's not being prevented. They should be in prison for that, you know, charge. That's illegal. It's kidnapping. And um, so, yeah, they're... It, that's an added problem. And I think it's mainly in Texas, but you probably know better, John, is it throughout? It's, it's certainly in Arizona too. Um, I have been confronted by those folks personally uh, a handful of times, and they are definitely out here. I mean, there's very recently, it was passing through um, on the way to Texas, uh, one of the take or border back convoys. You know, I think that um, this idea of nativism, um, which is fueling um, both the these sort of the vigilante movements, but also the politics about borders, um, we, where does it come from? And there's a lot of people who have done some really interesting scholarship about this. Wendy Brown is a, is a big one. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the points that she makes and other she and others make is that there's with the waning of other sorts of institutions like organized religion, like uh, labor unions, like um, true community, like old fashioned community ties. Um, and I think this is in part because of like the rise of internet and like global connectivity is people have lost or feel like threatened in some ways their identity. And um, one of the easiest things to fall back on and that politicians have recognized that they can really harness is that fear. Um, for losing this national identity, but national identities are artificially forged. And there's some other great books that have really sort of delved into the history of how these national identities are forged. But I think for, you know, if I could have a calm conversation with one of these vigilantes, which is a question, um, <laughs> I would ask them, you know, what is this community and this identity that you're seeking to protect? Where did it get created? Because if you really think about it, and you don't have to, it doesn't take too long to just get to the bottom of it. Like, so how do we define and how have we defined who is an American? And you can just like look at the beginning, like, well, um, the Constitution initially um, said that it was free white men. And how did that Constitution get drawn? And how, and how did the Constitution um, get to supposedly apply to what was then a very small portion of this continent? Well, it was through genocidal warfare that, that um, those lands were taken. And then extermination campaigns, forced assimilation, um, you know, excommunication, um, you know, this, this incredible legacy of, of extraordinary violence that has drawn the line that we now call the U.S.-Mexico border, that we now defend um, 
and has constituted what we think of as national identity. That is where it was forged. And so that is what you're protecting. I think like it, it's, it's, it, it really, to me, the bottom falls out of any argument of towards nativism when you think just, just for a second about the history of it. Um, so, um, you know, what, one of the other things I think about is like what I think true bordering implies, like true, true nativist bordering implies is the same exact message that Trump used for his first campaign is um, make America great again. That is what nativist border vigilantes are trying to do. They're trying to go back to a select moment in history where a certain group of people that they themselves identify with um, had were in power and had this culture that seemed dominant and they want to protect that. Um, so I think like I, I talked about the slippery slope. I think if you're trying to um, control the border and um, you know, stop certain people from going out. I think you're on that slippery slope towards a sort of a MAGA border and immigration politics. Um, we have, I think, time for one further question. And um, here's an interesting one. Um, I'm an immigrant and believe in open borders, but the notion that we should let immigrants in because we need them seems to be misplaced. California would not need migrants if it paid locals enough to take the jobs currently filled by low paid migrants. We need open borders to make up for the harm we've done abroad, not because we need workers in our abattoirs. Um, great point. And I, I, I make it in the book and I think I should have emphasized it when I was talking about the economics of, of migrants is when you make the economic argument for open borders, you risk commodifying migrants. And that is exactly what borders do. And I think it's important to dispel the myths about what would happen if migrants came in and what happens when migrants come in. But I think we can't only try to take in migrants because we need them for our economy. Like the GDP should not take priority over humanity. Um, so yes, a point very well taken um, about paying locals enough um, and maybe they would do those jobs. I think they've tried that in a number of different places. There was a whole, uh, UK campaign picket for Britain or something like that. I can't remember what, what the slogan was. And it just didn't work. It just like they tried to like get all this nationalistic, you know, pride and getting um, young young Britons out or young Brits to out and to the fields and it didn't work. And there's been US cases of that as well that people don't really want to, not that many people want to do it. Um, but yeah, so I wonder if, if you have a thought on that as well, Roxanne, especially because they were mentioning your farm labor in, in California. Yeah, they, um, you know, I, I've, um, when I wrote a memoir, Red Dirt Growing Up Oki, um, I dealt with the, the California Dust Bowl, you know, the migration of, uh, it was interesting. It was an internal, mostly white, uh, I mean, there were plenty of black, you know, um, uh, and uh, Native American among among those who really had to leave. I mean, it was impossible to, uh, to live there. And uh, we were in central Oklahoma. It was mostly, you know, it's mostly the panhandle in the north and Kansas, the, the, dust, the dust bowl. But they were very, very poor. They were in camps. You know, they were pretty much like... Um, the situation now is certainly not welcome. California was a very, very, um, I would say, almost fascistic uh, state at that time. It was excluding a Asians, you know, mistreating them, and uh, the railroad barons, and you know, all this stuff of California at that time. Um, these were not people who were treated very, very well, and they, you know, this, this. Um, experience of seeing migration, seeing some of my relatives, you know, leaving and friends and, and um, my dad just was adamant. He was, they weren't going to run him out of his hometown where he was born, you know, and uh, he, he just uh, kept going, you know, but we were extremely poor and um, uh probably should have been in that migration, but I, I'm kind of glad we weren't, you know, that I was able to grow up 
rule because I don't think um, I would now understand and almost none of my peers in academia or movement work grew up poor, except black people and, and Latinos, you know, and, um, uh, that it, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to explain, you know, the, again, you know, there's trauma involved in poverty always. But the, um, the California, uh, the Central Valley is very, very fraught, you know, the, 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 the pesticides, the living conditions, living in cars, living, in, and it, it's a third world country out there for the migrants. And many of them don't have, a, you know, full documentation. So they're exploited. Um, you know, they, they can't really call the, you know, organize and the organizing that Cesar Chavez uh, started you know, the United Farm Workers, it's kind of waned as uh, hopefully, you know, labor unions are coming back. But um, even even Cesar Chavez uh, didn't want to have undocumented people in the union at first. He changed his mind. But he even born in, you know, he was born in um, Arizona. Uh, and he looked down on on migrants, you know, yeah. that... that uh, he was. He didn't want the undocumented, um, but I think he he changed, you know, because of the the movement itself, um, having a the younger people especially. So yeah, California is. Uh, we don't have the kind of border issues as much. Um, it's a uh, pretty much you know California was a Spanish colony, and uh, well, so were the border states, but, you know, Texas, uh, the, white, the white slave owners took over there very, very early. Uh, so California was 1848, you know, before, and it was, it was um, Spanish and Mexican. So um, they're the Californios who aren't, you know, Chicanos, or they're, they're the old descendants of the old uh, Spanish settlers. And they're a kind of different class of people than the Mexicans um, who, you know, this was a part of Mexico who were just left, you know, suddenly they're in the United States. So it's a, it's a, a different situation on the border, but it's very much, you know, the Central Valley uh, and, and the Sacramento Valley, these far, you know, where most of the food in the United States is produced. Um, the strawberry fields, Ventura County. Uh, these are, you know, these these many are undocumented, and I think the 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 planters. Uh, well, they're called growers, you know, not, not planters like plantations, but they're growers. The corporations and big families. Um, they prefer the status to be. Um, uh, you know, to, to not to not be straightened out. They don't help any. And then it's seasonal, so then they can um, they can call in the border patrol and have them um, you know take them out, so they don't have to support them. You know, they don't when it's off season. So it's a very it's you know in many ways just as fraught, but in you know some different aspects of it. Uh, that uh, don't get as much attention, the treatment in California. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that. And uh, yeah, I guess to kind of wrap up, um, I would make a plea to folks who, if they've they've stuck with us this long, to um, try to to listen and understand, um, you know, from trusted sources what's going on with border and immigration politics. Understand that it's uh, that there's your people and um, that. Despite all of the, you know, political back and forth thing, um, what we're talking about has real effects and um, can cause serious harm and death. And um, it's not something to be taken lightly. I think we really need to understand um, what we want and how we want to treat people. And that's, you know, that's really the objective of this book. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned a couple of times that one of the central questions is how do we respond? Um, I think one of the other central questions of this book is who belongs and um, you know 
I'll, I'll leave that sort of to be answered for each of y'all. But, um, you know, I have an answer for that. I think that probably most people do. Um, and yeah, maybe maybe the last plea is, um, to, or I guess a thanks and a plea is like, you know, read the book. It's helpful to us. It's helpful to um, to folks who have been working on it. Um, Roxanne has a number of incredible books. Um, Not a Nation of Immigrants, I think that was your last book, is um, terrific and really elucidating. And um, yeah, read it, buy it, share it, gift it. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks so much again to Roxanne and to Haymarket and to all the folks who and, have stuck around. And I would add that um, in your book, you have um, so many resources referenced that, that people can go to and they're really uh, detailed. You know, it, it made me feel a little like, well, I wish this book had come out. I would have <laughs> done it like this, but, but it's a handbook as well as a literary work. And, uh, and a uh, an important intervention. So I think anyone interested in the border can find ways to um, participate or uh, help or at least teach like people who are teaching at whatever level. I think this book would be uh, just marvelous to use and even in high school, not just university. Thank you so much, John. It's been great to have a conversation with you. And same. Thanks, Roxanne. And yeah. And thanks. Thanks to Haymarket, the publisher. And um, I'll watch this on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> All right. Yeah.